and welcome to this week's Property Matters on Dublin South FM, the show that brings global trends to an Irish audience. You can contact us on Twitter at iProperty Radio or by email at hello at iPropertyRadio.com. Your host today is myself, Carol Tallon. We have something a little bit different for the show today. We're joined by Gary Cooper, Development Director at Ronan Group, and we're on location opposite the site of one of Ronan Group's most exciting developments um, on Merrion Road for Facebook. We might discuss that later. Gary, we're delighted to have you with us. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. So, Lo- lovely to be here. Thank you. Gary, before we start, because Ronan Group is such a synonymous name with Irish development, can we take a step back and maybe ask about your background? So how long have you been with Ronan Group? Uh, I recently joined Ronan Group, uh, probably uh, clear to say that it was a second time round. Uh, I joined in 2018, but uh, I had done a stint with uh, Treasury Holdings from 2000 to 2004. Okay. So Was that uh, in Ireland? It was, yes. Okay. Uh, I'd uh, been brought back to Ireland as a memento by my Irish wife. And I was fortunate enough to uh, meet uh, Dermot Dwyer, who was with Treasury at the time, uh, involved in Spencer Dock, the the convention Mm centre. And Kevin Kelly, who was uh, the ex-managing director of CISC, gave me my opportunity with Johnny and uh, Richard Barry. Okay. And that was back in 2000? It was, yes. Is that your first, was that the first company that you worked for in Ireland? It was, yeah, yeah. So, and um, had you come from a development or property or real estate background? I had. I was with uh, Lend Lease in Australia. They're a substantial developer and also uh, a listed PLC. Uh, so coming to an entrepreneurial uh, organisation was, yeah, it was interesting and challenging. Great fun. Yeah, I okay. really enjoyed it. And so from 2000 to 2004, they must have been very hectic years because we know there was a lot of activity at that time Hmm. and was there a sense, can you remember, because you were new to the Irish market, Hmm. was there a sense of what was to come from 2006-2007 onwards or in 2000 and 2004? I think think when you're immersed in it, it's it's something that you're astounded at how much is going on and I was lucky enough to arise arrive at the height of it. So 2000, you know, Dublin was buzzing, the, the amount of tower cranes, there was a sense of excitement in development. But generally, even in the industry my wife was in, her friends, everything was possible. And Ireland was spreading its tentacles across Europe and, and engaging. Uh, on the development side, uh, I was involved in Messable Burlington Road in Balls Bridge, 250,000 square foot development, massive opportunity for me. But in terms of the portfolio of development, there was so much going on. Spencer Dock was being developed, Central Park was being developed, uh, Treasury Holdings at the time were trying to uh, buy the Dome in London uh, and nearly pulled it off. <coughs> so at that time, you're immersed in what could be. And that was just a time of, it, of its time. And I yeah. don't know if there's going to be another time like that. I think that's really interesting when you say that everything was possible hmm. because then. Uh, just for me to understand the mindset, almost a collective mindset at that time, when you feel like all is possible, mm. is there ever a sense of vulnerability? Is there ever a sense of how long can this continue? Well, I suppose, take a point in time. I was 30. Uh, you're faced with massive opportunity and the economy is, nobody is saying no or taking a moment because it's so busy. Now I'm 50 and in retrospect, I have hopefully 20 years of uh, experience that says, okay, I'll be a little bit more cautious, yeah. peering around the corner a little bit more than what maybe I did previously. But also developers or the, the market has changed. Globally, we have changed. Mm-hmm. Whether we learn this generation or, is, or we forget the next generation, time will tell. Uh, but I think to answer your question is that, no, we didn't have any insight as to what could go wrong. But I think we'll be far more uh, transparent and far more, uh, let's say, the aspect of trying to be wise and looking at the downside as well as the upside. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does, but I suppose um, entrepreneurship at Mm. its core, you have to be an optimist. You have to see the potential. You have to to depend more on the potential than what could go wrong, otherwise Mm. you wouldn't do it. And I think property development actually a little bit like farming mm. it's the ultimate it's the ultimate entrepreneurship because you put everything into it mm. and 
I, I, I suppose where I'm leading with that is, yes, it's important to be cautious, but actually, you know, what we've really seen in Ireland, that was built by ambitious people who believed mm. all was possible. Mm. And Ronan Group would have been certainly among the leaders in the field there. But we need that spirit of entrepreneurship. We need people mm. who believe that all is possible. Um, I think really what I, what I would be interested to know is what changes have stopped us feeling like that again? Um, a policy, has policy kept pace? You know, has policy been more scared by what happened on policymakers? Well, I think just just in the, the, the let's say the um, reviewing the question, there's probably a number of subsets of markets to consider uh, how we invest now as opposed to what we did in the past. Are you involved actually only in the Irish operation or are you involved outside of Ireland? Uh, just in Ireland, yeah. Okay. So uh, if we look at housing, for, for instance, or, or residential development, mm -hmm. the market has put in place, and, and you know the story of the central bank and the lending criteria of mums and dads and, and young people, that is far more uh, forensic and far more uh, controlled. And... In the past, there was certainly an openness about commercial lending that isn't there now because there's far greater legislative uh, control. Okay. But it's also uh, realised a, a, let's say, a um, constraint on the residential market growing as what we would hope it would. In terms of commercial, we are... Can, can I just drill a little bit further into that? So... You mentioned residential and commercial there, but let's jump to the residential side. Mm. The macroprudential rules, um, so the central bank rules, we know now that they are in situ and mm. they're likely to remain for the mm. foreseeable future. So we're still capping first-time buyers at 3.5 times mm. their salary yeah. and 10% deposit, but all of those who are trading up or down looking at 20% deposit, that's, mm. that's such a huge problem it is, yeah. for people in the marketplace. Where, where do you stand on that? Have we overcorrected? I'd, I'd, I'd be wary to offer an opinion on behalf of Ronan Group. Well, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a personal context, I think that uh, this, the, the reasons for the controls are clear, that uh, we were provided a platform that didn't have enough control in place. We have seen a fundamental shift in the way we do business because we are now no longer building build to sell, we are now building build to rent or okay. PRS schemes. So that's had a, had a fundamental shift in how we produce products. So as a developer, entrepreneurial, uh, our principal, John Ronan, is clearly understanding the market and what is actually investment worthy. And it's not build to sell because those macro prudential controls are restrictive. Mm -hmm. However, we have in Ireland a very strong rental market, mm -hmm. and as entrepreneurs and as opportunists, and you know, we we do realise commercial benefit is that we are now heavily involved in the build to rent market. So we're still involved in residential, but the product shift is that it's a rental market, no longer a buy to sell market. Now, that doesn't help somebody out there looking to get on the property ladder. Uh, however, it is fundamentally trying to assist providing accommodation for those in need. Now, there is social affordable, which is covered by part five. We ourselves as a commercial developer don't get involved in, uh, let's say, that the wider portfolio for social affordable. There are housing bodies like Cluid and, and the like who are very, very good in that space. And they're gearing up with, with expertise that they work very well Correct. with developers. Yeah, Great absolutely. property managers and, and those approved housing bodies know their knitting. We, on the other hand, are about taking uh, investment, um, uh, private funds as well as you know, equity funds from global uh, sources and looking at long-term income and th that transparency of asset is attractive to global investment. It's no longer, for in, in my view, it's no longer Irish investors buying Irish product. It's Irish developers developing with global funds for long-term returns. That's that's a fundamental shift in product that we deliver. Yeah. Well, that's feeding into 
that's feeding into a much wider conversation that's going on in Dublin right now, um, not just in terms of the affordability of housing, but actually the availability of housing. Mm. So as a commercial developer, you're building for primarily multinationals coming over here and headquartered in Ireland or expanding their operation base in Ireland. Is that fair to say? Um, no, I don't think it is. Uh, we have a number of different areas of Dublin that we're doing developments. Uh, we're de- developing down in uh, Dunleary. Uh, we're also developing city centre. That, that What's product, happening in Dunleary? Uh, we have a asset there, uh, Cherrywood, um, mm-hmm. in the town centre. We've, we've created a, a scheme where, uh, with the assistance of DLRP, who are a property um, organisation as part of Dunleary Rathdown City Council, yeah. uh, they went to an open tender and invited developers to bid on a development, a site, which is approximately 13 acres, and that consists of a mixed-use scheme. So there's a small element of retail, predominantly uh, commercial development and uh, residential. So the mix is already set in what's called a UFDF, which I think I recall in my acronyms, uh, an urban framework development um, plan. Okay. Uh, it is uh, determined by Dunleary Rathdown City Council as part of their SDZ. It has determined uses and the density of that, and we're very happy to be involved in it. And in the, in the short term, we'll be lodging our first application for that development. And that has an element of residential. And at present, we are trying to create a precinct that doesn't have multinational occupiers. Yeah. Uh, but we are developing a product because, A, we understand there is a demand for housing. It's on the Lewis line. And, and that, that's a, a very important point, that we provide uh, affordable housing on exceptional infrastructure links. So we're trying very hard to reduce the number of car spaces in our development, promote Lewis as a major connector and public transport, Mm -hmm. and that we create a precinct where currently there is no housing. And so that's part of the Cherrywood ambition, I believe, with, um, with the stakeholders. Yeah, Cherrywood is a project that I've been monitoring for the last decade, really, and I, I think it's quite comparable to what maybe perhaps the Docklands would have been perceived mm. 20 and 30 years ago here. Okay. So as in, uh, there's an overall vision that's going to take decades to execute, mm. but that, that that has to start somewhere. In fact, I was out, I was out at Cherrywood only in the last few days while mm. the sun was shining and the cranes, the activity, the you can start to see a footprint there that was yeah. difficult to imagine. Yeah. Three, four, five years ago. Well, I think to give the accolades not only to um, to Heinz, who is, who is mm. the premier developer in the space, uh, they have got on with uh, a series of infrastructure moves that have opened up the wider site. Mm. And it doesn't mean that we haven't got our challenges out there, and uh, Dunleary Dun- Rathdown City Council have their own ambitions. But I think with the stakeholders that are active, you can see that there is momentum starting to build. Unfortunately, that it's market dictated. When demand rises in those locations, that's when you can develop and you actually start understanding the income side. Uh, And so it it has been slow, but it is now starting to move. But I'll give you a prime example is that uh, Central Park, Mm. um, that started in 2001. And that's being fully completed now as a live, work, play environment. So you have a, an amalgam of buildings where you have the likes of Vodafone, Merrill Lynch, Ulster Bank, stimulating employment opportunities, but also the residential, again, based on a major Lewis link and also road infrastructure has created a live, work, play, and play environment. So I think Central Park's a really good example is that ambition having been met and hopefully Cherrywood can actually follow that same path. Yeah, again, these are projects that are quite difficult to visualise and to understand all aspects mm. when you're in the midst of them. Like, So I remember more than a decade ago when we were trying to encourage buyers and investors out towards Central Park and Slorgan and Leopardstown and all of this yeah. area. The Lewis was just operational there and even so it was seen as very unattractive mm. because... Um, the homes were there, the apartments were there, but the infrastructure wasn't there. So mm. yes, you had transport, yes, you had apartments and affordable apartments at that time. But what you didn't have were schools, you didn't have shops, you didn't have yeah. um, places to walk down to get your Sunday papers Community. or... Yeah, community, mm. exactly. And that's one of the things that I think 
Cherry Wood seems to have taken a, a much better approach in terms of pulling place making and community driven agenda at the heart of the development as much as it's commercially viable. Mm. And I think that that makes a difference. Um, but then, of course, the market has moved on to a space where we're now at a time when we need greater housing and people are willing to look outside the M50 environments, which maybe they weren't before. Yeah. Uh, and what we're seeing is that uh, there is a shift uh, in certain organisations and, and take Cherrywood for example, Pharma seems to be moving in a direction in that space. Hopefully we can create that opportunity in terms of work opportunities. But if you're located in that location, you don't want to be travelling an hour in, an hour out, yeah. which a lot of people currently are doing. And we're, I suppose, working in this very broad thought that, you know, um, the 30-minute the, the city seems to be a concept that is developing globally, where you try and reduce your travel time to no more than an hour a day, mm. 30 minutes in either direction. But wherever that 30 minutes is, that's where your work environment community exists. Yeah. So the quality of life is far improved because if you're commuting currently three hours of a day, that's three hours less of either productivity or time with family or time engaging with other people. Quality of life drops off. Um, one of the biggest constraints that we have in this country is infrastructure. And I think that touches on the heightened density guidelines that uh, the minister back in 2018 uh, legislated for which promoted density around key transport nodes. And is, is that enough, though? It, doesn't there need to be a more progressive element of a transport plan? Because absolutely, the Lewis Connects just doesn't make sense for the city. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I would be, uh, personally, I think that the idea of congestion charge in the city would, would help. Yeah. I think that then that congestion charge paying for infrastructure, like a huge network of public transport systems, would be far more beneficial okay. for a city such as Dublin. Uh, and the reason being is that Dublin currently, I think, globally has one of the slowest traffic transport systems in the world. That is impacting on people's lives. So when we look at Cherrywood, <coughs> we're trying to create work employment opportunities with major tenants, but also provide living opportunities out there that you're not paying the city centre uh, rents or rates, uh, but you can have a live work opportunity. You're at the foot of the Wicklow Mountains in Dunleary on the coast. Um, look, I'm in sales mode a little bit, but we're we're genuinely well, actually thinking you're speaking about to the choir. I live in Blessington oh, purely spot, because yeah, of the yeah. Blessington Lakes. I choose to be outside of the M50. I choose to work my, my day around not um, a, a less complicated commute. So I, mm. I don't put myself into rush hour. And I see that as a luxury to be able to choose that. Mm. You know, so I, I opt not for city living, but I still don't want to be stuck in traffic three hours a day. Yeah. And if I if I worked in an environment where I had to be there nine to five, then that's where I would be. Mm. So even though I'm 35 minutes from the city centre, if if I had to commute for traditional work hours, then I would I would be in that category of three hours a day taking away from the quality of life and walking my dogs by the lake yeah. are the things that are that are important to me. Okay. Um, but I do believe it's the hallmark of any successful or functioning city or place that the people who live and work and contribute to the fabric mm. of society can afford to, to be there. And I think it, it's really interesting, um, and I don't want to take us off track, mm. but the, la the, pa the most recent... Um, CSO statistics showed in terms of professions that um, there were so few trades still employed in certain areas of Dublin, mm -hmm. which meant that anybody in trades feeding into the construction sector, they were coming from outside of Dublin. Okay. And this is a problem at a time when we have a, a, um, a shortage of labour in the construction industry. So I think that in the past there's been this disconnect or a lack of understanding that all of these things are connected. But the reality is, if plumbers and tilers and carpenters can't afford to live in Dublin, then suddenly, if all the development is happening in Dublin, they're travelling into work. Yeah. So, again, you know, the issue of affordable housing is a really important one for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. It's beyond just letting people have a quality of life and letting people live in the in the environments where or in the communities where they grew up and it goes beyond that it's more that 
we need a cross section of everybody yeah. in all communities in order to be able to continue to develop sustainable communities. Yeah. The key is in the word sustainable. And I, I think, again, it, it may be a little bit political, but the government, my understanding in, in Dublin, Ireland, has moved away from providing uh, social housing. They effectively don't deliver that as a product, but they empower approved housing bodies to deliver that in particular areas or regions. There are cities, though, doing it really well in terms of identifying uh, social affordable uh, development, residential with density, within city centre cores. And, for instance, uh, you know, I'm not saying uh, my home country is a panacea for all issues, but there's some very interesting Your home country being Australia. Correct. Uh, where uh, the, the listed REITs and uh, property trusts are engaged in delivering uh, essential service uh, housing. So for nurses, for, for uh, teachers, for uh, police, uh, fire services, that those employees have affordable housing developments within the city centre core. Mm -hmm. And that their prerequisite is not only means tested, it's affordable housing, but it's also identifying that those services shouldn't be located two hours from the city where there is affordability, but those services aren't needed in those locations. They're, they're needed in the city centre. So I think that there's opportunities to create really interesting opportunities that create those affordable housing schemes within the city. But that requires, I suppose, a policy understanding and shift. And for entrepreneurial developers like ourselves, there is a, okay, how do we make sure that there is a return for us? Because we are commercial. Okay, well, actually, speaking of policy changes that really need to happen, that's something that I definitely want to get in and discuss with you further. We need to take a quick break now, but we'll be joined in a few moments by Gary Cooper, Development Director of the Rona Group. Stay tuned. Everything's fine on 93.9 Dublin South FM. Now, welcome back to Property Matters on iProperty Radio. We're back joined by Gary Cooper, Development Director of Rona Group, on location. And you can contact us on Twitter at iProperty Radio or hello at iPropertyRadio.com. So as mentioned before the break, we're on location with Gary Cooper, Development Director at Ronan Group. And just before we went to the break, we were starting to talk about policy changes, what needs to happen. So I suppose from your professional experience and from the, the group's agenda, what needs to change as we face into a new decade? Mm. Um, I, I, well, I think I'm going to leave with our chin that we've been very clear uh, in recent times about the height and density guidelines that the Minister has brought into legislation and honouring the content of those height and density guidelines. And we're having um, certainly challenges in terms of the interpretation of that by local council and also... Sorry. No, I, I'm, I'm going to get you to to really get into this properly because I think that you're mm. very diplomatic and I think you're using very <laughs> diplomatic language. Yeah. But let's call it like it is. Mm. Um, new guidelines were introduced. Mm. Dublin City Council, particularly in, in um, some of the key street, uh, strategic development zones and the interpretation of local planners mm. seems at odds with that. Yeah. Uh, so let's. Yeah, we've been very vocal talk, about let, it. Yeah, but let's let's be specific. So, is there a particular development we can talk about? Well, let's let's talk about the SDZ in North Lots, for example. Mm -hmm. That uh, the minister himself, a, a number of years ago, in a hotel in front of a public audience, said, "Look out to the skyline," and that's about missed ambition. The height and density guidelines come out, and then what we're seeing is not a. Uh, a reflection of that policy, but we see a frustration because in the developments there that we're doing in the Docklands, and there is only a limited number of sites left, and we're developing two of those. So there's only three or four at present that are, are left capable of doing density plays, but we're not seeing a policy change relevant to the SDZ. And that is extremely difficult because we are out in the marketplace attempting to get funding, for particular developments. We see the opportunity based on the height and density guideline amendment saying, yes, we're promoting greater opportunities to create more places to live and work. And yet we're not seeing that policy being adopted by council. Where's the disconnect? 
That is a fantastic question. If I could answer that, I think I'd be uh, a long way to solving the problem. Okay. What, what can, I, can I hazard a guess hmm. and say, are, are we talking about um, locally locally appointed councillors who are sitting for a period of four years and, you know... No, I, no, I, I, I wouldn't say it's uh, elected officials. I, I think it's the policy of uh, the, the city itself, of council. We are promoting density. This, this city cannot afford to expand outwards. Every city in Europe needs to reconsider its density play and actually have people not commuting three hours a day, okay. but actually be living close to their place of work. And and which, by the way, is an agenda that uh, Dublin City Council has put forward. Oh, it, yeah, it's also in the framework of, of this, ga- yeah. uh, this, this, this government, in the national uh, planning framework. Uh, it is clear that it is policy, but it is not being played out. Now, we're in 2020, and this policy, this legislation was passed in 2018. Where is the disconnect? We are looking for greater height. Yes, we're a commercial developer, but we are talking about the ability for more people to live in the city centre not for the city to expand and have greater commuting time. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure we're talking about is already in place with Lewis and the Docklands in North Lots. And yet as one of only three or four remaining sites, we can't go back into council and seek a fundamental shift that honours the height and density guideline principles and seek greater density. We're being frustrated by that, as I think a lot of developers are. And that is constraining on the economy of Dublin. Dublin is no longer competing with London or Paris. We're not in the game. We are competing with secondary cities, and those cities all have designated development areas that promote density. They've copped on that they need to create greater opportunities of density, and that is more people living in a more concentrated environment. People are comfortable living in apartments. Not everybody wants uh, you know, 2.5 kids, two cars in the front, and a backyard at the back. But this is a relatively new transition um, for Irish, for sorry, for people in Ireland to make. But but who are you talking about? Because the yeah. younger generation, and I'm certainly a lot younger than I, are very comfortable living in apartments. We are yeah. seeing that people are very comfortable living in the city centre. If we're to promote jobs here in Ireland, the likes of Salesforce, 60% of the employees will be actually from Ireland. Mm-hmm. That is, you know, Ireland is a very well-educated, really fantastic environment to create job opportunities. But Salesforce, for instance, do need to create another 40% of those jobs because there's simply not enough people to facilitate those jobs here in Ireland. Mm-hmm. So they're going to bring 40% in. Those people want to live in city centres. They want to be part of a vibrant community to actually say, I like living in Dublin. And in three years' time, I hope to God that they actually want to keep living here, but that they're part of the fabric. And Ireland has very quickly shifted to a very multicultural environment. Let's embrace that, but don't be restrictive when a government's policy is saying one thing, and yet council or the legislative framework is saying another. We see a massive disconnect, and it is absolutely frustrating. It is costing Ireland jobs. It is costing people the the breadth of living accommodation opportunities and it's also frustrating the economy. I think there needs to be a fundamental shift in adoption of Eamon Murphy's policy and the legislative framework and get council moving in that direction very quickly. Otherwise, we are going to lose those opportunities. Can I ask, because I feel like this is a conversation that's been happening for more than a decade in Ireland. Hmm. I can remember doing media interviews a decade ago as to why are our people in Ireland so slow to embrace apartment living beyond uh, renting or as starter homes. Mm. And a huge part of that was as soon as they start to have a family or grow their family, then there's this need for additional space. But obviously, if you're living within a, um, a city, you have all of the space of the city around if it's yeah. designed for that. But interestingly, I had a conversation on air actually just um, before the Christmas period with an estate agent from the Docklands Mm. who lives in the Docklands, whose job is trading in apartments in the Docklands and um, he has a a young family. And one of the things that he mentioned to us, he loves the Docklands, it's it's where he has chosen to base his career and his business um, and it's something that he's seen evolve over the past decade. 
but he mentioned that there is a lack of green space. Now, is it a case that our placemaking isn't going enough to, to, to think about community initiatives or communal space? Um, because in Dublin Bay, there's the potential for so much for so much amenity, enjoyable amenity space. Yeah. So is it just lack of thoughtful planning? And uh, look, that's the first one. But the second thing I just wanted to ask you about was, you know, you talked about how the economics of development are pushing us more towards um, the PRS and the private rented sector. Yet, for people to choose to live in apartments as owner-occupiers or as tenants in a, in a sustainable or long-term way, Apartments need to be designed for living, for life. So, like, I've lived in apartments in Spain and it, they're actually much better equipped than my three-bedroom house in the suburbs, you know, uh, in terms of utility rooms and things like that. So I actually have much greater space in a three-bed apartment than I do in a three-bed house now because they were designed for whole-of-life living. Okay. Have apartments in Dublin... Is, is the PRS driving um, apartments that aren't designed for long-term living? Well, by their very nature, they are designed around, first of all, uh, the requirement of the market, okay? Mm -hmm. So we as commercial developers are interested in understanding who, the, who, who is actually going to rent those spaces mm -hmm. and then what is the market prepared to pay for those spaces but also that your product is actually commensurate with what the market expects and hopefully ticking a box that actually we actually do something a little bit more exceptional. Mm -hmm. So the product that we're developing in, in terms of build to rent is inclusive of community. So we have community amenity spaces. We have things far more in, let's say, beneficial than maybe what a traditional build to sell unit would enjoy. We have movie theatres, we have communal kitchens, we have far greater acknowledgement of bicycle parks, we have green space, we have uh, you know, chargeable electric points for cars, we have uh, you know, uh, work areas, we have gymnasiums. That's all part of the build to rent offer. Yeah. And what we're finding is this is a asset class that the, the, the United States has had for many years, it's called multifamily. Mm -hmm. In Europe, Germany has been the leader in this. The UK is ahead of us, but we're catching up very quickly. But we are just developing that product now. But there's a fundamental shift in the way we live, is that the next generation is very comfortable living in those apartments and creating that community. That may not be acceptable to somebody who's 50 or 60. So mm -hmm. we're, we're splitting demographics on, on this basis. What we're trying to do is create living opportunities for those people living in the precincts that we're actually creating jobs for. So Salesforce, Facebook, we're interested in actually not only engaging with the local community and giving them living opportunities, but also the employees who are moving to these areas, such as Cherrywood. And that's why we're going to de deliver commercial, but also the living opportunities. Okay. And to go back to your point about uh, amenity in the Docklands, there's a couple of things. Um, the city, I think, is making every effort to consider the livability of the city. Now, everybody's going to have an opinion. I have an opinion, but what my opinion is is different to somebody else's. But if we look at the Liffey and we look at Dublin Bay, they are fantastic amenities to embrace. And if I look just beyond that one kilometre, two kilometre inner city court, I look at the facilities such as out at Fairview and Clontarf, the playing pitches, the all-weather pitches, the facilities that the GAA have, or within the city centre, the improvements such as Marion Square. That is now an open space that people embrace and in summer is a phenomenal space. That is what cities do. They recreate themselves within the confines and the parameters of which they are or have been created. We're not intending to destroy anything about the Georgian Quarter. Embrace that, but improve the amenity that exists. Yes, we may not have phenomenal internal green spaces, but it's about creating better streets or more embracing spaces and attractors that bring people in. I think what Dublin City Council is doing in terms of, uh, in the IFSC, the, the, um, the, the, the water experience park, not everybody agrees with it. But this is a potential development that could be a massive attractor for the yeah. city. I think that how it works out, 
I hope it's a huge success, yeah. but at least there's an attempt to engage what is effectively a desolate space of just water that nobody uses. Yeah, and actually I think that particular project, the whitewater rafting, hmm. that's, a, that's an example of a project that maybe the community have been calling out for a project like this hmm. for decades, and now it's announced, and suddenly the detractors um, speak out maybe without without understanding the impact of a community like that yeah. for the local community. Yeah. It's not even a case of is it the local community that will be using it? Is it will it become a tourist attraction? Will it become a recreational activity for anybody yeah. in the city? But the knock on effect of that for local retail and yeah. and communities. So I, I think that that's maybe a source of frustration and I'm quite sure that if I had somebody from the local authority sitting here, they would tell me that that's a source of frustration for them. Yeah, They're sure. called to initiate projects, they initiate a project and... I'm sure it is, and yet we, we're very happy to go down to Spain and, and enjoy a, a water park there in the middle of summer. Yeah. And then we come back to our own city and we find a white water experience in our city centre and we're up in arms. I, th I think that's a little bit um, conceited, actually. I, yeah. I think that people need to understand what do great cities do? They embrace the ingredients, what they have, but they are forever changing. They are forever embracing the next generation and how to actually engage with people from outside and bring them in and make it inclusive. That's what great cities do. They reinvent themselves. Is there an element of nimbyism that's not in my backyard? I mean, we always associate that with development, but is it a case of well-established communities just not being comfortable with, with some of the changes? Because Dublin... Like all cities, cities need to be dynamic. They need to be changing. Mm. The skyline needs to be changing. It's not even a case that we do it today and it stays for 100 years. It yeah. should be constantly shifting to reflect the design talent we have, the development talent we have, the community builders that we have and the community who are using it and how they're using it. We know that that's changing. Yeah. Is there an element to accept this dynamic nature of living cities? One would hope that people would be a little bit broader in their view about understanding what cities need to stimulate things. If you look back 20 years ago, I look at the change in Dublin and realise that the Docklands was effectively an open coal pit of pollution when the, the gasometer was effectively constraining the growth of the city. Now I look at the river and realise that the, it is a centre of commerce and a fantastic, in 20 years, that this city has fundamentally shifted itself to now be a second si Silicon Valley. What, what an immense, brilliant uh, shift. And yet there is now a, a cap being placed on the city for its next uh, element of growth. So is it nimbyism? I'm not sure. Um, but I think maybe it's not peering around the corner and realising Dublin's next iteration. Mm -hmm. And that could be attributed to things like the height and density guidelines or people not being supportive of these efforts to embrace new amenity. amenity. What we're doing now in 20 years' time will be something different again. I feel like there's a, maybe a line that separates the visionaries um, you know, maybe with people who struggle to, to see the vision. And, I mean, you're talking about the changes that happened in the Docklands over 20 years, but I think it's quite telling that 30 and 40 years ago, mm. developers like Harry Crosby and 30 years ago, developers like your boss mm. would have seen the potential and actually being among the first to acquire warehouses and old mills and bakeries in that area. So we actually spent a long time talking about residential and that wasn't our plan at all. I really <laughs> want to talk to you about commercial properties. So we're going to take a quick break yep. and come back to that. So just join us in a few moments and we'll, take, we'll be back with Gary Cooper, Development Director at Ronan Group. This is Dublin South FM. Now, welcome back to Property Matters on iProperty Radio. We're back joined by Gary Cooper, Development Director of Ronan Group on location and... Gary, before the break, we discussed some of the policy changes we want to see happen, um, particularly those around height and, and density. And we've spent a long time talking about residential, but I really want to discuss commercial, um, the future of commercial spaces, particularly office in Dublin, because, you know, a couple of years ago, there was a conversation start, starting to play out in the Irish media that has Ireland, has Dublin in particular, too much office space. And yet we can see that that, 
the market has more than stepped up to fill that to fill that uh, supply. Mm. So where do you see office space in Dublin as we face into the next decade? Okay, uh, interesting question. Uh, if you had have asked me two years ago, would we as a developer uh, and the brilliance of, um, uh, I suppose, realising an opportunity, um, maybe that's the wrong word to frame it. Um, John Ronan realised an opportunity with uh, Salesforce and has created with a number of very uh, interesting and intelligent people an opportunity for Salesforce to occupy the largest leasehold in the country at 430,000 square feet. Uh, at the same instance, just before that, we have Facebook occupying a building of 350,000 square feet. If you had one of those in a lifetime, you'd be doing very, very well. Mm -hmm. If you have two in a lifetime, you're doing exceptionally well. We had two in the same year. Yeah. Phenomenal. And um, we're actually recording today um, from Bald's Bridge, so yeah. we're just opposite the site of the former AIB, and yeah. we know that they, they had a 25-year lease to Facebook. Mm. When what's the completion date on that? Yeah, we're looking at uh, a 2022 completion. Uh, so we're in the ground. Uh, uh, the project team, uh, led by Ronan Group, uh, FESP, and a, a lineup of great consultants: Henry J. Lyons, uh, Cronin Sutton, O'Connor Sutton Cronin, uh, doing a great scheme uh, where uh, two buildings uh, with a central podium will be delivered. And Facebook are not only occupying the existing site, but they'll occupy the two cornerstone buildings, which will be directly opposite us. So, yeah, fantastic, fantastic scheme. And what will be the capacity of that in terms of staff numbers? So you're looking at around about two, two and a half thousand staff in that building. Uh, Facebook are quite generous with their occupancy levels. Uh, they have fantastic amenity. I think what they are overall on the site, they'll have circa 8,000 employees. And when you think about those people that need to be housed, fed, clothed, um, further education, uh, uh, you know, kids going to school, an amazing opportunity for Dublin in terms of an, an economic stimulator and also generating growth in the local area. Brilliant. And, and an excellent site for it. But, you know, you touched on the amenities there mm -hmm. um, that such occupiers provide. Mm -hmm. I can only assume from a developer delivering this mm -hmm. Um, that the quality, it, it, the deliverables go so far beyond quality output. So a couple of, a couple of um, over the last number of years, space as a service has really taken off as a concept yeah. that's driving added value across the real estate sector globally. Yeah. And Ireland is, not only is Ireland not immune to that, but actually as we have the, head, the European headquarters of so many multinationals, it's yeah. important that we become leaders in this. Mm -hmm. So space as a service really um, is, a, is a concept that has started to be taken seriously yeah. in, in the last number of years. But I, I read an opinion piece in the UK media that referred to it as an arms race for office delivery because mm -hmm. essentially um, that it's become each, each new building must out deliver the one before it okay. and we have seen some amazing examples mm -hmm. of uh, delivery across office buildings so what is Ronan Group doing that's keeping you t uh, top of the game in this? So we, we are watching that market uh, I wouldn't say that we're playing in that space just yet but it is a very interesting idea that you no longer consider your property as an asset but as a service and you create a more holistic environment of experiences, not only working, but the ability to create multiple opportunities to create an exceptional space. So there are global leaders out there. Uh, there's been some recent abject failures in terms of uh, those companies coming to a point in time where they may be uh, overstretched. I, I would take the view that maybe that's not a failure of the company, that there's a, a failure of the valuation methodologies that we use for startups yeah. and for VC. So I would see this more as a VC failure than a, than a space as a service provider failure. Okay. Well, if I just look at our product versus what where the market is, let's mm -hmm. say starting to engage, we are traditionally big space providers. So we, we look at, you know, exceptional large organisations who 
take on large space. And that for us is a really clear business model where we want to provide exemplar schemes for e exemplar occupiers. Mm -hmm. When we talk about property as a service instead of an asset, that would traditionally bring on the opportunity of a more broader spectrum of occupiers. And whilst we have buildings in our portfolio that would have multiple occupiers, it's a space that we are just starting to understand and trying to learn with a curve uh, and how we embrace that in the future. So we're just starting to take tiny baby steps in understanding that. Um, recent experiences in other jurisdictions that they uh, people have taken on what we work have created and realise they can play in the same space in providing exceptional services that get rolled up for that occupier and create something that is unique. Where uh, previously you had to, let's say, um, have external services cater for your uh, space and the, you know, um, uh, FaceTiming and so on and, and, you know, video conferencing wasn't part of the asset package. But now that cable can deliver imagery, it can be rentalised, it can create a greater, broader depth of experiences, that ultimately becomes commercial. So we're just starting to play in that space, but we wouldn't be, I suppose, um, quite leading that, that area here in Ireland yet. There are people doing really good things though. Okay, well let's talk about the two large projects that you yeah. mentioned there for HubSpot and, and the latest project for Facebook. You know, what, are there different aspects of this project, you know, and I imagine much of this is confidential, so if there's anything you can share with us in terms of um, levelling up uh, the quality of office space, you know, are there any more unusual features going in? Well, uh, and sorry, just a slight uh, correction, Salesforce, um, uh, not HubSpot. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, no, Salesforce, yeah, Salesforce, yeah. Salesforce no, no, my no, apologies. No, Salesforce. You're okay. I was well, on the wrong side of the river. Well, well I think um, uh, to be clear is that we, we had phenomenal representation in Knight Frank, our agents, and Cushman Wakefield on, on behalf of the tenant. And in bringing those occupiers, we not only create exceptional buildings mm -hmm. and we try to lead the market in exceptional design, but also that we're very open and very communicative in understanding their requirements. So take Salesforce, they're extremely green conscious and I don't say that with any sort of whim, but they have clearly an ambition to reduce their carbon footprint and it's not simply greenwash as speak. So we look at the, uh, look at LEED, you know, we're LEED Platinum in our development, which is going to be a phenomenal uh, realisation that that building is considering its energy usage down the line. It's not simply creating a development that has carbon efficient product being put into it, but they're looking at their footprint beyond. Okay. We're looking at the BR rating, we're looking at environmentally conscious energy systems that they adopt as a tenant moving forward and that they reduce their carbon footprint. So I suppose in all of this it's not only creating exemplar schemes which is part of the vision that John Ronan would have and the family but also understanding the client and who the product is for and I suppose having the flexibility in that communication and understanding clearly what the market is driving and in Salesforce and Facebook's case absolutely completely bought into the idea of creating energy efficient not only buildings but also energy systems to deliver power and services to those buildings. Okay, well, um, obviously uh, emerging technologies for the built environment is something that um, I feel very strongly about mm. through the, the not-for-profit um, PropTech Ireland and I know that Ronald Group and yourself uh, personally have been very helpful in meeting PropTech startups and construction technology startups. Um, there's, as building standards change and as client expectations change, mm. and indeed as the clients themselves change, um, embracing new technology is very important. But one of the things that I found is that, um, unfortunately, the industry in Ireland can be quite a closed shop. So say for new startups, just getting in, if they're not already connected, they can find it very difficult to get access to testing environments. Okay. Um, and when we have large, large occupiers coming in, you know, these are ideal scenarios. Uh, they're, they're ideal situations 
where startups can go in and test things like um, sensors, or everything that's feeding into uh, sustainable energy usage. Mm. Um, you know, for example, even even down to optimizing space. You know, yeah. and I know Smart Dublin and Smart Docklands have done great things, yeah. and and I know that you've been supportive of those. But in terms of projects that you're running at the moment, have you started to look at new technologies, maybe that you you haven't been using before? Yeah, um, we, we a, a recent example of that, and yes, we are. Uh, for us, it's it's a not a double-edged sword, but we specify a product, which is our built environment, and we go for planning. And that gives us parameters regarding the height, the density, the mass and scale of that product, and then we take that to market, and we market that product to a wider audience. And we seek finance for it, and we also seek uh, engagement with occupiers. And that, if you like, is a very forensic process with a design team, and you, you undertake that journey, and ultimately you will know what your product is before you go to site, and then you have a three-year build. So its adoption of technology during the construction phase is very difficult because you're trying to uh, then hedge your costs mm -hmm. in a way, uh, and the I suppose the um, the adoption of new technology could be finite, but it's a difficult prospect because you've got finance for so much, and adopting new technology that may be not tested or unproven is sometimes difficult to incorporate. But one thing um, recently, and, and we're always open to new ideas, is the, the idea about uh, backup generators. Um, so traditionally, they're being diesel driven. And the market is saying, well, what's the alternative? We don't want diesel backups. Now, these things only run maybe 10 hours a year yeah. and only kick in at a, at a cataclysmic event. So hopefully, our buildings are well built and we'll never have to run them. But now we're looking at the idea of alternative power sources. and. I think ESB Networks have a really interesting program happening in North Lots where they're promoting new technology. And even yesterday with a particular party, we're thinking about hydrogen and or you know lithium batteries as a backup power. What does that mean? That means that those diesel generators may be considered as a thing of the past, but a lithium battery won't be able to power up uh, one building at the scale that we do. So it may need a battery farm. These battery farms take a big space. Where do you position those? Um, we're, we're talking earlier about amenity and green space. Well, these things need a lot of air around them and they take up a lot of space. So is hydrogen the next issue? So we're starting to test those things about peering around corners and saying, what is the technology for five years' time? So we're trying to re re reduce our footprint and encourage our occupiers as well as other developers to say okay can we somehow develop a grid of backup power that everybody can avail but then you realize that maybe uh, the council the fire officers aren't quite up to speed with that technology we're learning they're learning mm -hmm. things take time to actually adopt those new opportunities yeah look it's something that we've experienced ourselves um, Gary, there's so much more that actually I wanted to cover with you in terms of construction margins, in terms of the industry's almost persistent lobby um, yeah. in relation to, to VAT uh, or even a temporary VAT reprieve. There's so many things that we could have touched on today in terms of innovative building technology like yeah. modular and off-site and I know perhaps that's something you're exploring in we the are. new decade so absolutely you might... all those three things we've we've got a view on absolutely yeah so look we, we might come back and revisit some of those issues yeah. again in the future if you're willing so um for now thank you so much for joining us um that was gary cooper development director with rona group that's it from us today thank you for listening into property matters the show where property matters get in touch with the show by emailing hello at ipropertyradio.com or twitter at ipropertyradio also, thank you to Peter Rice on Sound, show producer Katie Tallon, and we're back at the same time next week. From myself, Carl Tallon, and all the team here, have a great week. <laughs>